I try to be careful, precise with my language, the words I use, because I want to make sure when people hear what I'm saying, they genuinely understand the ideas behind what I'm saying. Have you ever listened to centre-left liberal journalist Tim Pool on YouTube and come away with the impression that although the guy talks for a long time, the genuine ideas behind what he's saying never seem all that clear? It's not that Tim is inarticulate or incapable of expressing his ideas, but more that the explanations he gives are so dense, meandering and convoluted that they have the effect of muddying up what he's trying to say rather than making things any clearer for the audience. To give you an example of what I mean, check out the opening of this video he made where he starts by claiming he's unearthed official proof that when companies get woke, they go broke. Get woke, go broke, officially confirmed by new data. This is from Purdue University, April 15th. Confirmation of hidden facts, something most people have claimed. This idea that when businesses try to get woke, they go broke. So he has got official evidence proving that, as he said, when businesses try to get woke, they go broke. All right, let's go. Let's hear it. Now, it's not actually true, unfortunately. Wait, 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 wait. What? It's not true? Rewind the tape. Get woke, go broke, officially confirmed by new data. So it's been officially confirmed, but it's not true. That's an incredibly confusing way of reporting information. Uh, it's, it's, it probably in, in some regard is true to a certain extent, and this data does confirm it to a certain extent. Oh, so it is true and confirmed to a certain extent, and the data kind of confirms it to a certain extent. But the reason I say it's not true is not, not to claim that it's, uh, um, well, I, I should rephrase that. It's not black and white is a better way to say it. So, so it is, um, I would say more likely to be true for obvious reasons but it's not absolute. That's probably a better way to put it, because you'll say anything, won't you? Words don't mean a thing to you, do they? You do you see what I mean when I say the way Tim Pool presents information is confusing? It's like he's presenting the news in the form of a riddle, and you've got to get past his word tricks and mind games to get to the bottom of what he actually means. When I heard Tim say that he tries to be precise with language so that people can genuinely understand the ideas behind what he's saying, I thought to myself, eh? That does not map on to my experience of listening to you speak. If anything, the way Tim Pool uses language seems precisely engineered to not be clear, to not be direct, to beat about the bush endlessly for whatever reason. You Can Peep, a more recent video Tim made about Trump's attempts to overturn the results of the 2020 election, and observed the same overabundance of explanation, but a complete lack of clarity. Imagine a barometer which displays on one side the proposition that Trump's overturning efforts are a massive, illegitimate waste of time, and on the other side, the proposition that Trump is on some sort of unprecedented path to victory. You'll find that although these two perspectives are completely irreconcilable and contradictory, Tim swings from one to the other and back again in an almost comically contradictory style. Alan Dershowitz says, Donald Trump will win. Is it possible? 100% it is possible. But I'm not saying the chance of him actually pulling it off are 100%. No, it's astronomical. Maybe not astronomical, but and maybe not a lottery tickets, but I'm not going to bet on this, okay? You know, maybe it's just wishful thinking of people sitting here saying, Trump can still win, Trump can still win, and maybe he can't. He, well, you know, he can still win, but maybe he won't is a better way to put it. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're right. It just, it's just, it's just all weird. Not only are the implications of Tim's reporting unclear, he seems purposefully obtuse in the way he presents things, as if he doesn't want to commit to anything with solid implications either way. Tim's equivocating, filibustering tendencies are in large part what has led him to having a reputation amongst his own audience as a milquetoast fence-sitter. To define what those words mean, milquetoast means a timid or feeble person, someone who is bland and inoffensive at all times. An offense-sitter is someone who supports both sides in a disagreement because they don't want to annoy or offend anyone. It's not a nice thing to be called. At first, when Tim's viewers labeled him as a fence-sitter, it was meant as a genuine criticism of his reporting style. They perceived Tim's constant dithering between contradictory positions as cowardice, him not being bold enough to take a stand for the things he actually believed in. However, as time has gone on and Tim's reporting has taken on a far more partisan tone, 
particularly during the 2020 election, where Tim threw his support behind the right-wing Republican Party spearheaded by Donald Trump. I'm voting Trump. And I'm probably just going to go Republican across the board. I'm done. I'm done playing games. I don't care. I observed the change taking place where Tim's audience began using the phrase milquetoast fence sitter, not as an insult, but rather as a term of endearment, a defense of Tim as a reporter, particularly when Tim would be accused of political bias or extremism for the overconfident videos he was making in support of Donald Trump. I think we might be seeing a 49 state landslide. Viewers of Tim Pool's channel would adamantly defend him by reasserting that he was in fact a milquetoast moderate reporter whose views only seemed radical to those who were so far left they'd lost all touch with reality. A particularly interesting component to this situation is that Tim himself started to use fencing as a personal badge of honor in defending his reporting style. They accuse me of operating in bad faith and I am I am milk toast fence sitter, tepid, lukewarm, all of these things. They're actively trying to suppress independent media, even from milk toast fence sitters like me. My videos have been taken down and I'm the milk toast fence sitter guy. They want you to hold a negative view of me as if I've done something wrong. Sorry, man. There's a reason why people call me a milk toast fence sitter. The fact that Tim Pool would repeatedly lay claim to fencing as a core part of his identity raises interesting questions about what the label of being a fence sitter actually means when it comes to Tim Pool videos and also leads one to wonder why a reporter of Tim's stature would want to embrace fencing, given its oftentimes negative implications. In this video, we're gonna have a look at some Tim Pool content, some of his fencing arguments, and hopefully by the time we're done, we'll have made it to the middle of his fencing fortress and discovered what it truly takes to be political YouTube's eternal man in the middle. And of course, I'm gonna run some bangers too. Are you mad? Let's start by looking at this video from 2018. CNN's Anderson Cooper only consumes Soylent. To give you some background context to this, Tim published this video at a time when there was a popular meme going around right-wing online spaces that left-wing men were consuming soy and those soy products were transforming left-wing men into effeminate girly boys. Now, let's talk about soy boys. What's a soy boy? Typically, soy boy refers to, you know, male feminists and left-wing men who consume too much soy, and because soy has phytoestrogens, that makes men effeminate. This video constitutes a pretty good microcosm of the convoluted way in which Tim does his reporting. I don't know if this is the sort of thing you'd catch listening to him on the fly, but there is no statement he makes that he doesn't end up undermining, contradicting, or completely walking back by the time he's finished speaking. For example, he starts by saying he doesn't actually believe soy feminizes men, and authoritatively quotes a scientific study to back up his position. Soy has phytoestrogens that makes men effeminate. But my understanding is that's actually factually incorrect. Even in high doses, we found no evidence that the estrogen-like compounds in soy called isoflavones stimulate cell growth, cell growth or other markers for cancer risk in breast tissue. Okay, so the soy thing is completely made up. Study proves this. Case closed. But then in the next sentence, Tim immediately backs away from the findings he just read out, saying, sorry, I actually don't know anything about this. I just did a quick Google search. Well, this this, this study, I, I gotta admit, is just, uh, it's a cursor. I just did a quick Google search and pulled something up, but there's a bunch of other studies, so I recommend reading it. Tim definitively cited that study as a credible answer to the question at hand, but just two seconds later, he's backtracking, diminishing what he just said and undermining the scientific findings, which he himself decided to present for this news segment. Next, Tim moves on to say that the idea of the soy boy is just a joke and most people don't actually believe it. I think when it comes to the idea of the soy boy, it's mostly a joke. Most people recognize that soy isn't actually turning dudes into effeminate, you know, weirdos. But then, in the next sentence, Tim highlights an Infowars video from Paul Joseph Watson and says that Paul has data showing that soy does turn men into effeminate weirdos. But I'm pretty sure Paul Joseph Watson has a video where he goes over data showing that it does. So it's another very strange presentation of information here. Tim tells us that nobody actually believes soy feminizes men, but then hastily presents the contrary information that a YouTuber has shown with data that it does. And to fully grasp the bizarreness of the contradiction Tim is weaving here, have a closer look at the language he uses. 
when he says most people recognize soy doesn't feminize men, the fact that he used the verb recognize implies something about his own stance on the issue. To recognize something is to acknowledge a truth, to realize something which is already valid. So we are given the deliberate impression that like the most people Tim talks about, he doesn't believe the soy myth to be true. But then look at his choice of language over here in the very next sentence that comes out of his mouth. Paul Joseph Watson's video argues the counterfactual narrative that soy does feminize men, something which Tim believes to be incorrect. However, despite this, Tim frames Paul not as someone claiming an opposing narrative to his own or alleging something which is false, but rather Paul showing it with data. Again, there are logical implications to the language Tim uses here. You don't describe someone as showing something with data if you know they're incorrect. It's a choice of language which demonstrates Tim ascribing legitimacy, framing Paul's video as a credible information source which he finds compelling. So panning back out to the overall picture of what Tim has achieved with his monologue in the span of 10 seconds, he, in one moment, positions himself as someone who disbelieves the idea that soy feminizes men, to the point where this truth is so blindingly obvious that those who disagree are dismissed as being a distinct minority who nobody should concern themselves with. And then, he instantly repositions himself as someone who finds the idea that soy feminizes men perfectly legitimate, credible, and believable, with data backing it up. Near the end of Tim's video, he says that drinking soy makes you less likely to grow breasts. The addition of high levels of dietary soy isoflavones tended to block estrogen effects in breast tissue. So I can say this, you are less likely to grow breasts if you drink soy products, apparently. But then in the next sentence, Tim is telling viewers that he's read some stories about men drinking soy and getting estrogen effects. There are some stories I read about guys who started consuming uh, soy products and started getting, you know, like, estrogen effects. So drinking soy makes you less likely to grow breasts, but also Tim has heard stories of men drinking soy and getting estrogen effects, which to me sounds like they did grow breasts. Tim finally concludes his video by saying that if you consume too much soy, it may have an impact and feminize you. And if you consume a ton of soy, although it's less potent, you're, you're basically hitting every single receptor with a barrage nonstop. In which case, if you consume too much, it may actually have an impact. So you might now be getting a sense of the whiplash of Tim Paul's reporting, the way he did this back and forth between mind boggling contradictory statements. He tells us categorically that soy doesn't feminize people, but hold up, he hasn't really looked into it yet. Then he says the idea of the soy boy is just a joke. No one believes it's scientifically true, but wait, Paul Joseph Watson has a video with data showing it is scientifically true. Then Tim says soy makes you less likely to grow breasts, but on the other hand, there are stories of men drinking it and getting some feminine estrogen effects from doing that activity. How well has Tim done here at giving his viewers a clear factual insight into soy and its biological effects on the male body? I would say that Tim has presented this topic with the exact level of straight talking clarity he is capable of within his fence sitting framework, which is to say, none. If we're looking at what the scientific literature shows, there's just no evidence of soy having any feminizing effect on people. Meta-analyses conducted specifically on men have found that even when soy is consumed over extended periods of time and in volumes exceeding typical intake in countries like Japan where they eat a lot of soy, it doesn't do anything to male hormone levels. I don't think these scientific findings would be clear to you from watching Tim Pool's video. Half the statements he makes point you in the exact opposite direction, legitimizing this idea that there is some womanly magic contained in soy products that viewers need to have a keen awareness of. The Paul Joseph Watson video, which Tim referenced as a data-driven information source, is a deeply confused mix of quack science from bodybuilders, unfounded health claims from new age nutritionists, and non-academic blog posts, which Paul subsequently claimed was all just a big joke or a meme. And the stories Tim says he's personally read about men consuming too much soy and getting estrogen effects, that's a claim which is exceptionally vague, with no sources given, which is just incredibly poor journalistic form. So what does this video show us about the fence-sitting Tim engages in whilst reporting the news? Well, true to the essence of fence-sitting, Tim is pandering to both sides of an argument. On the one hand, the idea that soy feminizes men, and on the other hand, the proposition that soy feminization is a scientifically inaccurate myth. 
but I think it's worth reflecting on the nature of these two opposing viewpoints. One of them is vindicated by scientific literature. It meets the threshold for validity insofar as we can expect any scientific claim to be valid until such a point the research might show a signal in the opposite direction. The other position Tim panders to is supported by what? An Infowars video where a guy speaks in a gay chipmunk voice. Soy isn't healthy? Okay, but I'm literally using it as a dairy substitute, so what's your point? Soy boy. And Tim Pool's own personal unsourced anecdotes. Two extremely shaky foundations which immediately crack under scrutiny. However, this massive discrepancy between the evidence presented on either side of the debate which is extremely clear when you dig into the evidence. That is totally lost in Tim Pool's pontificating stream of consciousness. As a result, scientifically illiterate nonsense emerges from Tim Pool's reporting, being given the same weight and credibility as claims vindicated by scientific research. Therein lies an interesting problem. If you're a fence sitter and you set the parameters of your fence around an unfounded conspiracy theory, your reporting essentially functions to legitimize that conspiracy theory. And this is something you're gonna see more of as we dig further into Tim Pool's videos. Let's take a look at another Tim Pool video, which is illustrative of the same problem. Hillary Clinton is the new 2020 Democratic frontrunner. This is not a joke. Tim released this video in December 2019, one year ahead of the 2020 presidential election in which, memorably, Hillary Clinton never ran as a candidate. Tim wanted to tell his audience about a theory he'd been working on. Here's my working theory on Hillary Clinton. All of his other candidates are failing, right? Joe Biden is now has now lost his edge. I think they're going to say, you know, we, we don't have a strong enough candidate. We need a real leader. Joe Biden isn't up to it. You've seen his gaffes. Elizabeth Warren is, is fizzling out. We need a, a moderate voice. How about Hillary Clinton? I think that's the play. So Tim's assessment is that behind closed doors, the establishment is lining up Hillary Clinton to run as the real Democratic candidate in 2020, replacing Joe Biden because he's making too many gaffes. What evidence does Tim have for believing this? Well, he highlights that Hillary Clinton is being included in 2020 election polls. Why would she be included in the polls unless the elites are trying to test her popularity to see if they can insert her into the race? This new Harvard poll, in my opinion, is being done to see if there's a door open for Hillary because Hillary wants to run. I really do. Why would they include Hillary Clinton in this poll? She's not running. They want to know if people would support her. Additionally, Tim reports to his followers the exact manner in which Hillary will announce her candidacy, saying it will happen ahead of the Iowa or New Hampshire primary. And just give, give it a moment. Just before some, you know, like the first primary or Iowa or New Hampshire or something, she's going to say... I didn't want to do this, but the American people need me. That's what she's going to do. Finally, Tim describes the motivations behind the plan to insert Hillary into the race, vividly describing how mentally unwell Joe Biden is. Joe Biden can't keep his, he, he, first of all, he doesn't know where he is. And, and I really mean this. It's not a gaffe at this point, right? And, and other people have pointed this out. Joe Biden, it is not a gaffe when he says Iowa instead of New Hampshire and Minnesota instead of you know, New York or whatever. That's not a gaffe, dude. He literally doesn't know where he is because he does it almost every time. And, he, and then he tries to like save face, but dude, the guy's out of it. So at this stage, Tim has one, reported that he thinks the establishment are planning to run Hillary Clinton. Two, given definitive evidence in the form of polls, which include Clinton's name, even though she's not running. Three, described how and when Clinton will announce her candidacy. And four, ascribed the motivations behind the plan to insert her into the race. The establishment need her because Joe Biden is mentally ill. So as a Tim Pool viewer watching this, it's not far-fetched to assume you'd believe what Tim is suggesting as a not just plausible, but likely outcome. In the comments section, you can see that this is the case. All these people are being swept along by the excitement of an incoming Hillary Clinton nomination that Tim, through his reporting, has conveyed as all but guaranteed. But despite the whole narrative we've just seen Tim build, through his arguments, through the evidence he presented, through the absolute confidence with which he conveyed everything, in the same video, there are random moments where Tim inexplicably scrambles back to the fence and steps away from the bold claims that he himself has portrayed as an inevitability. Look, man, let me be real. 
I'm not entirely convinced she will run. So I'm, I'm kind of, I gotta be honest, I'm leaning towards, I really don't think Hillary Clinton will run. At this point, it's too late. I don't think she'll be she'll she'll be running. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't necessarily want to read through all of this other rehashed speculation about what's going on. So, in the same video where we have Tim saying that the establishment are planning to run Hillary Clinton, that the polls show them gearing up to do this, and that there is a guaranteed monologue Hillary will drop when she announces her candidacy ahead of the Iowa or New Hampshire primary, in a stunning turn of events, Tim declares that actually none of what he said will actually happen. He doesn't think there'll be a Hillary Clinton run. It's too late anyway. He doesn't want to speculate on these things. All of this, the passionate argument for the secret Hillary Clinton nomination and the dismissive argument against, all of it occurs in the span of a 15 minute news segment. It's as if there are two tiny journalists in Tim's brain working from the same bits of information, but arriving at opposite conclusions. And they both have access to levers which they can pull to operate Tim's mouth, and neither of them is managing to retain full control of him, so he's spurting off statements in opposite directions. So I think what's really happen happening is, there is a strong possibility Hillary Clinton does run. I don't think she'll be, she'll, she'll be running, I don't, I don't. One persona that Tim is performing as fiercely believes Hillary will be running as the Democratic candidate, and he has all this evidence to back it up. But Tim's other persona thinks that's utter nonsense and we shouldn't speculate on these trivial bits of information. Now, in case it wasn't already clear to you, the argument Tim presented for Hillary Clinton's secret run was based on irrational, connect the linear dots to make a unicorn sort of thinking. Case in point, Tim draws massive attention to the fact that Hillary Clinton's name was being included in 2020 polls and suggests this is evidence of the establishment lining her up for a presidential run. But why? It's actually incredibly common for pollsters to compare previous candidates to the ones currently running because it gives readers a wider perspective of everyone's popularity rankings. In 2016, it wasn't uncommon to see Barack Obama's name being included in polls. Was the establishment planning a secret run for Barack Obama's third term? No, that would have been impossible and illegal. And in 2020 polls, if we're looking at what names were being thrown into the mix, we also had people like Michelle Obama, who, similarly to Hillary Clinton, wasn't planning a run for president. A rational person should not be looking at names being included in these polls and interpreting them as some sort of secret establishment plot to run candidates at the 11th hour. Why would they include Hillary Clinton in this poll? She's not running. They want to know if people would support her. Above and beyond Tim Pool's conspiracy theorizing over Clinton's name being included in a poll, at the time when he made his video, the registration deadline for several critical state primaries had already long since passed, including notably the one for New Hampshire. Hillary Clinton hadn't filed for any of them making the prospect that she'd be running for president an utterly delusional fantasy that no serious reporter would ever entertain. There is a strong possibility Hillary Clinton does run. In a way, you could describe Tim's strategy here as fencing, right? He slithers between the position that Hillary will be appearing in the presidential race and on the other hand, the position that she won't. But look at where Tim places the poles of his fence. We have the plausible reality of the situation, the fact that all candidates had already been announced and any late entrants were all but impossible given the elapsed registration deadlines. And then on the other hand, we have Tim's bizarre sensationalistic speculations that the establishment are secretly putting Hillary Clinton's name in polls so they can test her popularity and insert her into the race for which she hasn't even filed for primaries. Is Tim being milk toast or moderate by sitting on this fence? Absolutely not. Milk toast moderate people reject radical and extreme viewpoints. They don't entertain extreme viewpoints and then caveat that maybe what I've said isn't true. Remember as well where this conspiracy theory has come from, Tim's own reporting. He was the one that suggested it and put all the evidence together to legitimize it. If what we're seeing from Tim here was how moderation worked, then Alex Jones could become moderate simply by saying, maybe they're not turning the frogs gay. You know, making a small caveat that the opposite thing to what you're saying might be true doesn't magically retract your whole argument, the obvious conclusion you were leading your viewers to through rhetoric. Let's have a look at Tim is a fence sitter exhibit C. Top Trump official issues warning, leftist revolt is coming, Democrats will not concede the election. A top communications official for Donald Trump has issued a dire warning. 
that leftists are being trained for insurrection. And the Democrats will refuse to concede the election. He is warning of armed revolt. Obviously, this was made by Tim just ahead of the 2020 election. In this video, Tim oscillates wildly between two contradictory positions. On the one hand, he says the prophecy of a leftist armed revolt might be the unhinged ravings of a madman. Perhaps this is the ravings of a madman paranoid and delusional from seeing endless streams of videos of far leftists engaging in conflict in the streets. The New York Times says he needs evidence, and he definitely does. I'm not going to believe that this guy's correct. But on the other hand, Tim says this could be a competent government official warning people of a genuine armed leftist insurrection on the basis of accurate government intel, which only he has access to. But maybe it's more than the ravings of a madman. Maybe it's a man with insider information working in the government telling his close personal friends to buy ammo because it's going to get bad. Maybe this guy, this guy, Michael Caputo, just a crazy, crazy guy. He's just one guy. He's nuts. What if he's not? What if he's not crazy? What if he's an insider who has access to government information? And so he's speaking up and telling you what he's seeing in the government. Well, that's worrisome. Throughout the video, Tim conjures up evidence of his own to legitimize the idea that an armed leftist insurrection is round the corner. For example, Tim says he thinks there are leftists who are training, and that in the blue Democrat area where he lives, the gun store is sold out of ammo and guns. I think there are leftists who are training. I think there is a high potential for civil conflict. But look, ammo is being sold out. I live in a very blue area, very Democrat area. And the gun store is sold out of basically everything. I mean, they have got some guns and they got bird shot, but most of the other ammo, just not there. I wonder what that means. The insinuation Tim is clearly making here under the guise of just asking questions is that Democrats are arming themselves for an insurrection just as the Trump official warned about. However, before the video is over, true to form, Tim delivers a pretty significant caveat. He says that although he thinks leftists will go nuts upon seeing Trump's landslide victory in the upcoming election, he also says that maybe he is wrong and is just being a crazy internet person. So what does that mean? I think it's possible that Donald Trump wins an enormous landslide. Hear, hear me out. The Democrats then seeing the enormous landslide and not knowing how to process it go nuts. There will be some big law and order and insurrection act moments, but the United States will hold or the establishment is right. We're all wrong. We're crazy internet people. What do we know? That could be the case. Obviously, we have now been through the 2020 election and we didn't end up seeing any armed leftist insurrections. But even putting aside the benefit of hindsight, if we look at the information Tim was working from at the time to suggest that Michael Caputo had access to government information about a leftist armed insurrection, we can see how implausible what Tim was suggesting actually was. Michael Caputo was the Assistant Secretary of Public Affairs in the Department of Health and Human Services. The central concerns of this department are medicine, public health, and social services. I found something on the Wikipedia page saying they do some work around bioterrorism, but that's not the kind of thing that involves people with guns. It's about mitigating impacts on human, plant, and animal health. You know what department Michael Caputo didn't work for? The Department of Homeland Security, who are responsible for preventing terrorism. They'd be your guys with information on an armed insurrection threat, and famously, they're a department which doesn't go around telling everyone the information they've gathered. But Let's just assume they did tell Michael Caputo, the health and social care guy, or that he somehow got hold of this insider information via some other means. Now, imagine you're Michael in this situation. You've received this highly sensitive information about an armed domestic terrorism threat, and your main job as Assistant Secretary of Public Affairs in the Department of Health and Human Services is ensuring the health, safety, and well-being of everyone in America. And now consider what Tim is suggesting that in this volatile, high-stakes scenario, where there is genuine intel of an armed leftist insurrection on the horizon, what this non-crazy, competent public health official chose to do was to tell his close personal friends to buy ammo. And he did this not by telling them in person, or over the phone, or even by direct message. He jumped on Facebook Live in a public broadcast to 5,000 Facebook followers and indiscriminately just announced the top secret government information to his entire social media feed. I'm not going anywhere. They're going to have to kill me. And unfortunately, I think that's where this is going. The partisan Democrats, the conjugal media, 
and the scientists, the deep state scientists, want America sick through November. They cannot afford for us to have any good news before November because they're already losing. There are scientists working for this government who do not want America to get better. Did you hear me? I'm not going anywhere. They're not going to run me out. If the president asks me to leave, I will leave. I really want to leave. Some of you who know me know that my health is failing. My mental health is definitely failing. What if he's not crazy? Tim's theory of Michael Caputo being a competent official who just wanted to warn a few close friends about genuine intel he had falls down completely when you watch the Facebook live stream Caputo actually made. He doesn't pinpoint any intel which could be used to prepare people for a domestic insurrection threat. It's a series of vague illusions about people being out to get him and deep state scientists who don't want to heal people. And you can tell he isn't mentally in a good place at the time of recording. Shortly after his Facebook live stream, and just a few days after Tim Pool's video positioning Caputo as a credible information source, Michael Caputo apologized for his outburst and was placed on leave following a diagnosis of metastatic head and neck cancer. So let's summarize what we've seen so far. We've seen a video where Tim sits on the fence about whether or not soy feminizes men, a video where Tim sits on the fence about whether or not Hillary Clinton will be inserted into the presidential race by the establishment at the 11th hour, and a video where Tim sits on the fence about whether or not a Trump government official has received top secret intel of a genuine armed leftist insurrection plot. It's worth taking a step back and acknowledging that, from a purely logical standpoint, none of the fence-sitting rationalizations Tim has made here actually make any sense. If you think the idea that soy feminizes men is factually incorrect, as Tim does, then it's kind of illogical that you'd be referencing an Infowars video that alleges the opposite as a data-driven source of information, because to your own understanding, Paul Joseph Watson is spreading misinformation. Likewise, if you don't think Hillary Clinton will actually run for president, as Tim acknowledges, then it doesn't make sense for you to be conjuring up conspiratorial evidence of an establishment plot to install her as the Democratic candidate, because remember, you don't think she's running. You don't think any of this is gonna happen. So why are you leading all of us on this wild goose chase for something that you don't even believe is gonna happen? And finally, if you suspect there's a chance that an information source is mentally unwell, as Tim does in the case of the Trump official Michael Caputo, it's strange to hold that person up as a genuine source of secret government intel and weave this sprawling narrative around their claims because you're effectively hanging your journalistic integrity on the testimony of a guy who you think might be mentally ill. It doesn't make any sense. The reporting we've seen from Tim in these examples isn't just strange, it's implausible. The guy takes one set of facts and consistently manages to pull out two randomly opposite conclusions. The New York Times says he needs evidence, and he definitely does. I'm not gonna believe that this guy's correct. He's speaking up and telling you what he's seeing in the government. Well, that's worrisome. I have a brain tumor. Like, he talks as if these non sequiturs and contradictions coming out of his mouth are perfectly normal things for a reporter to be saying and thinking, but they're conceptually impossible. This brings me on to something more fundamental we need to grapple with, which is that I don't think Tim is being sincere when he pulls these diametrically opposed conclusions out of thin air. When Tim reports the news, it never feels like he is communicating his sincere beliefs but rather positioning himself strategically around the topic at hand, constructing an evocative performance. And for this reason, along with others I'm about to get into, I feel that calling Tim a fencer sort of misses the mark in terms of what he's actually doing in these videos. When you watch a fat load of Tim Pool news segments, what you'll notice is that Tim routinely front loads his monologue with incendiary, politically charged, often far-fetched narratives, which he invests significant time expounding upon. But then at random moments, Tim suddenly backs away from these narratives that he's created, caveating that the opposite of everything he said might also be true, and saying that he doesn't want to allege anything without evidence, despite the fact that in most instances by this point he's usually alleged a whole load of stuff without evidence. Putting aside the uncanny absurdity of all this, it's worth paying special attention to the way Tim uses rhetoric when weaving sensationalist narratives versus how he speaks when caveating the opposite. When Tim is entertaining sensationalistic claims, he gets visibly energized and his manner is intense. He delivers statements passionately, he patiently, methodically develops persuasive arguments, and he conjures up a lot of circumstantial and anecdotal evidence to support the sensationalistic angle, whether that be Hillary Clinton's secret election campaign or the armed leftist insurrection. 
Tim is not just reading and broadcasting information here, he is taking the viewer on a persuasive emotional journey, using rhetoric to make things which might initially seem far-fetched suddenly feel plausible. By contrast, when Tim suddenly pivots to acknowledge the other side of the story, when he admits, for example, he doesn't actually think Hillary will be running, and he recognises the Facebook guy predicting a leftist insurrection might just be paranoid and delusional, these acknowledgements are incredibly understated. The forceful cadence and heartfelt passion of Tim's earlier delivery is replaced with bureaucratic indifference. Tim throws out these contradictory statements of clarification which come completely out of the blue, completely divorced from his main argument, without any weight behind them or any counter evidence being given in their favour. Even when you're watching Tim saying these caveats live, as soon as he's moved on to his next bit of dialogue, you've forgotten them because they are, by their very design, forgettable. What this ultimately means is that although two viewpoints are theoretically represented in each Tim Pool video, only one of them is elaborated on and given room to resonate. And you can see this effect playing out in Tim's comments sections. When Tim expounded upon the theory that the establishment would be inserting Hillary Clinton into the race at the 11th hour, his viewers believed him and ran with that narrative, regardless of the fact that Tim quietly walked back the claim at several points during the video. Similarly, when Tim said there'd be an armed leftist insurrection, again, his viewers believed him and began rallying around each other for the upcoming battle with their political enemies, despite the fact that Tim pointed out the information source might not have been credible. You could say that these people are ignoring some of the information Tim gives, but who can blame them? The way Tim structures his reporting and selectively employs rhetoric guarantees this outcome. Tim's fleeting acknowledgements of reality are entirely divorced from the main thrust of his hyperbolic, sensationalizing sermons. And this is why it doesn't seem accurate to describe Tim as a fencer. He is aggressively selling the goods on one side of the fence. His quote-unquote counter-arguments represent nothing more than flaccid backpedaling of things that have already been alleged during the sensationalist portion of his news coverage. I don't know if there's a proper academic term to describe what's going on here, so I've made one up. I call it Shouting Idiot. Whispering Sensible Person. It captures this idea that Tim Pool shouts the sensationalist parts of his videos to enthrall the audience, and then whispers sensible caveats without conviction to ensure that none of the misinformation he spreads while in sensationalist mode ever becomes a hill he has to die on later. Let's look at some examples of this. In the build-up to the 2020 election, Tim repeatedly argued that Trump would win in a 49-state landslide, something with a close to 0% chance of happening. But each time Tim made this prediction, he made sure to also whisper the sensible but forgettable caveat that, on the other hand, Maybe Trump would not win in a 49 state landslide. If Trump's doing this well, 49 state landslide. Okay, maybe not. Maybe that's a bit much. Plus you got Trump's secret voters. Trump landslide, man, huh? Maybe not, I don't know. I have been saying I think we could see a 49 state landslide, but I could be wrong. Based on my personal feeling, my gut feeling, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Trump had a 49 state landslide, but who knows? A gift to Donald Trump of a massive 49 state landslide. I know it's silly to try and claim Trump's gonna landslide and we may see a, a 49 state landslide. Maybe a 50 state landslide, that'd be amazing. I don't know exactly what we'll see. Part of me is still worried that the Democrats will win. The shouted claim of the 49 state landslide is delivered with emotion, conviction, and bravado. By contrast, Tim displays a bit of contrition and indifference when slipping in the sensible caveat that Maybe the claim is a bit much. Maybe he's wrong. It's actually quite a silly prediction. Maybe the Democrats, who Tim designated as landslided losers, are actually going to win the election. Remember that forming a logical argument is not Tim's goal here. It's engaging his audience with attention-grabbing claims and then scrubbing those claims of personal ownership so that if it comes up in the future, Tim can deny it was ever something he said or believed. Well, uh, the left likes to hyper focus on things that I got wrong or hypotheticals. My favorite one is the 49 state landslide for Trump, where I said, like, if Trump chooses uh, Tulsi Gabbard for national security advisor and Andrew Yang for economic advisor and then the rest of his cabinet, 49 state landslide. Wow. I said stuff like that or, or legalizes marijuana and, and, and issues commutations for every nonviolent defender. 
not that 49 stands 49 state landslide literally meant he would win 49 states. It was more of a figurative of Trump landslide. Woo. B like big victory. Win, win bigly. Yeah. Win bigly. And so yeah, they take yeah. all of those out of context and make it seem like oh, that was genuinely yeah, 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 like, yeah. oh, he's going to win. Oh, Tim was using figurative language on all those occasions. We got a regular T.S. Eliot over here. Here's another example of the shouting idiot whispering sensible person strategy. Following Trump's loss in the 2020 election, Tim persuasively sold the narrative that despite losing, Trump could still become president by overturning the ballot results, something which has never been done in living memory. But after making that claim, Tim would then reliably walk it back with the whispered acknowledgement that actually, maybe Trump was destined for failure. Trump need only freeze everything up if he wants to win. There's a path to Trump flipping this. There is a possible path for Donald Trump to win, and they don't want to accept that could be the case. They could theoretically throw out every mail-in ballot, and then Trump wins in a landslide. Listen, I don't think it's very likely that Trump pulls this off. I really, really don't. I think Trump might win an illegal victory. I really, really do. Trump can win through the courts. Trump can pepper the courts, forcing a House delegation vote in which he will win. And the Supreme Court says, Trump wins. Donald Trump wins. But if Joe Biden wins, he wins. And, uh... You know, I'm not going to play any stupid games. It sounds like he is correctly predicting what will happen. And if he is correct, then Donald Trump will become president again for another term. I am not saying it's going to happen. In fact, I'm not entirely convinced we're at a point where I can say confidently it's it, Trump's got a good shot of it. Then it would go to House delegations and Trump will win. Trump could win in the courts. I'm not suggesting I think it's likely this happens. I'm saying the possibility is there. My current thoughts. The media is going to call it for Biden. Trump will file legal suits and win. And then for the next four years, the left will scream Trump stole the election. Does that mean that Donald Trump is going to win? No. I've said over and over again, I think we are on track for Joe Biden to be inaugurated. I'm warning you, Trump could win if he so chooses. But you know what, man? I don't know. Trump might actually win. Maybe you should have paid attention early on and not underestimated your opponent. Maybe Trump won't really win. I'm not sure. Trump is going to win. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Trump is going for the win. That's what I'm saying. He's going for the win. Again, it's an entirely illogical way of conveying information, but it serves the purpose of allowing Tim to disseminate that sensationalist claim. Trump can still win, whilst for his own plausible deniability, disavowing it at the same time. You know what's going to happen, though? The, the, these leftists are going to pull all of this stuff out of context. They'll take it out of context and claim I was screaming that Trump will win, even though he, he was losing or whatever. But they love doing this. I guess just because they want to make everybody hate each other. Another flagship shouted piece of information in Temple videos is the idea that America is on the brink of civil war, a term which comes with a literal definition of being a high intensity conflict often involving regular armed forces that is sustained, organized, and large scale. Watch how Tim persuasively builds the case that a civil war is on the horizon based on things he has heard and a general vibe he has before he pivots back to whispering the admission that actually America might not be on the brink of civil war. Will there be a civil war? I'm hearing from so many people that yes, we're on that track. A civil war is coming. That's what they said. They're all saying the same thing. Civil war. Maybe things will be okay. Maybe this is just getting bad because we're, we're a couple months out from an election. High profile individuals across this country and in many other countries have entertained the real possibility of a civil war in the United States. People are buying guns in record numbers, including liberals, people who used to be for gun control. They're buying body armor in massive numbers. So I can only assume what people are planning for. These things are all happening. Maybe they're isolated incidents, sure, fine, whatever. Man, it sure does feel like we are inches away from Civil War 2.0. Maybe not. Maybe that won't happen. And it's things like this that lead people to believe we are dangerously close to a civil war. I'm not saying it will happen. Both sides say, I'm the real government. And then what does the Secret Service do? What would anyone do? Civil war, right? I don't know if a civil war will actually happen. This could lead to civil war. It's funny. All of these people have been saying it. What you need to be careful of is when the government starts choosing sides. And they just did. Maybe I'm wrong. Don't listen to me. Form your own opinion. Here are some more quick fire examples of Tim executing the shouting idiot, whispering sensible person strategy. In this video, Tim Paul tells his viewers about the Kavanaugh effect, which is this thing that's gonna make loads of regular Americans and moderates run full speed to vote for Donald Trump. Smears, lies, and insane accusations resulted in something called the Kavanaugh effect. It riled up Republicans and many moderates to support Republicans and Donald Trump. 
because most people thought what they were doing to Brett Kavanaugh was insane. In all likelihood, regular Americans are going to run full speed to vote for Trump and Republicans. Why? The Kavanaugh effect. But then Tim clarifies that he has no idea whether or not it will actually make anyone vote for Trump. Whether this will translate into real enthusiasm among Republicans or encourage middle of the road voters to vote for Trump is yet to be seen. We'll have to wait to the election. In February of 2020, Tim says he feels like America is witnessing the end of the Democratic Party. I kind of just feel like we are witnessing the end of the Democratic Party. Then he immediately walks it back saying maybe he's just overthinking things. Maybe I'm just uh, being, I'm just exaggerating yes. or, or, or being sensationalist. Yes. Like maybe I'm thinking too, too much into it. In this video from September 2020, Tim says that Trump is going to drop something in October, which will shock the soul of the American nation. Donald Trump is going to get a plethora of information revealing just how dirty the past administration was. Just wait. October is around the corner. If you think it's spicy now, I think an October surprise is coming and it is going to shock the core of this nation. But then he says that on the other hand, maybe nothing will happen. I will warn you, however, don't get your hopes up. Do not get your hopes up. This could be another one of these stories. Just another trail of breadcrumbs that leads nowhere. In this video, Tim says that we are on the verge of a market crash so big that it will dwarf the 2008 recession. It seems we are staring down the barrel of the next major market crash, one that will dwarf 2008. Then he says that maybe he's just looking into things too much and being paranoid. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe I'm looking too much into it. Maybe I'm paranoid. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just paranoid. That's fine. I'll accept that. In this video, Tim insinuates that problems with the American economy are a conspiratorial plot being carried out on purpose to demoralize the American public. It's demoralization. The American people are confused, scared, angry, hungry. The economy is being shut down. All while this is going on, it seems almost on purpose to put all the Americans in a powder keg, light it up, and watch it go. Then he walks it back, saying maybe he's just overworked. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just uh, overworked. There is no claim so sensationalistic, kooky, or hyperbolic that Tim Pool won't shout it to his audience and then whisper that he might be wrong in the next sentence. This is the shouting idiot, whispering sensible person model of news reporting, and it is transparently deceptive and insidiously manipulative. It allows Tim to stir the pot with sensationist claims he has no factual basis for, and then bureaucratically walk them back, spreading misinformation, but avoiding public accountability for his own words. And for me, it's this deceptive practice that dominates Tim Pool videos. Not fence sitting, but sensationalizing and backpedaling. The final thing to discuss before this video is over is, why does Tim do this? Given the size of his platform and the loyalty of the audience he has, why does he feel this need to hide his opinions behind layers of subterfuge instead of just speaking his mind and saying what he genuinely believes without the backpedal? Well, as it happens, the critiques of Tim Pool in this video are nothing new. In fact, members of Tim Pool's own viewer base in his YouTube comment section, in his Reddit, and on other sites where his viewers congregate have commented on this bizarre tendency Tim has of saying things only to unsay them two seconds later. And there are a range of different theories people have for why he might be hiding his true opinions. Some of Tim's viewers feel that Tim has to self-censor his opinions in order to preserve his channel on YouTube given the censorious nature of the platform. According to this line of thinking, if Tim was to honestly state what he really thought about things, he would be banned. So he literally has to obscure his opinions for survival. Another line of thinking amongst more conservative Tim Pool viewers is that Tim is far more ideologically aligned with their hardline America first nationalism than he lets on. And his fencing is some sort of strategic move intended to bring moderates and liberals on YouTube round to the right wing populist MAGA worldview. A lot of people on sites like The Donald raised this during the 2020 election and were very thankful to Tim for bringing more people to their movement. However, I want to discard all this silly political theorizing and posit that something people often forget is the extent to which Tim is subject to the same normal pressures as his counterparts in the mainstream media, in that he needs to constantly find ways of raising engagement on his channel in order to drive his bottom line, pay his employees, etc. And the tried and tested formula for getting engagement in news content, whether you're in front of a well-lit MSNBC backdrop or Tim's sword and gun crossed over, it's fucking badass, is sensationalism. Studies have shown that sensationalism in news coverage makes people engage with stories a lot more. 
People spend a longer time watching the news when it has a sensationalist angle, and this effect is further amplified when the stories are about negative events such as fire, accidents, crime, and riots. However, although media viewers are drawn to hypersensationalism, they don't see it as something which can be easily reconciled with honest journalism. An Axios poll from early 2021 showed that one of the big reasons people had for distrusting the media was that they believed reporters were purposefully misleading them through false claims and gross exaggerations. Ironically enough, the exact same things that drive people's engagement in news in the first place. People are inherently massively hypocritical like that. Although Tim Pool's monologues are contradictory, muddled, and dense, they actually present a pragmatic solution to this problem, in that they allow Tim to deliver sensationalist angles, whilst retrospectively justifying it to his audience as moderate, fence-sitting analysis. They want you to hold a negative view of me as if I've done something wrong. Sorry, man. There's a reason why people call me a milk toast fence sitter. Unlike the mainstream media, Tim Pool is not someone who grossly exaggerates and alleges false claims because he's a fencer, simply exploring one half of an equation. The fact that what he's saying often comes across as hyperbolic, excessive, and implausible is negated by the fact that he also makes sure to say the opposite. Not in a way which would be persuasive to anyone who's already bought into Tim's sensationalist angle, and not in a way which would turn off any invested believers who see Tim as a close ally and teller of hard truths. But the caveats are still there in Tim's video. So an illusion of balance is constantly carefully maintained, even if it's not reflected in the logical outcomes of Tim's reporting. And make no mistake, the value of the fence-sitter label is not lost on Tim Pool. And I come to a conclusion, I don't come to it easily, which is why people call me a milk toast fence sitter. When it comes to, you know, a, policy, mil a milk toast what? Fence sitter. Fence sitter. Yeah, because I often don't take very strong opinions on a lot of political issues. I've never been this hard, hardcore part as an individual. You know, I'm a fence sitter for uh, obvious reasons. I don't have strong enough opinions one way or the other on, on the way the country should be run. So that's why I'm, I'm you know, I'm, uh, you know, people say I'm a fence sitter or whatever, but no, I think I have just a rather moderate position. You know, people want me to jump on one side or the other overtly, and I'm like, it's not so simple. What Tim is doing by loudly banging the drum of his own milk toast fencing identity is something close to lampshading. If you haven't come across the term lampshading before, it means the creator is drawing specific attention to something in their own work which feels implausible or contrived or which stands out for some other negative reason and the creator is deliberately drawing the audience's attention to this thing in order to reassure them that the creator is aware of the thing, they're in on the joke. A lot of YouTubers use lampshading to get away with bad jokes or hand wave poor production quality or generally own the fact that they're a bit weird. It's actually a great way of nipping these kinds of criticism in the bud because by directly acknowledging a negative thing about their own work, it takes the wind out of the sails of those who would otherwise use it to attack them. It's not as fun to levy a criticism when the person you're trying to use it against has already acknowledged the thing you were going to say. What Tim's doing here is actually far more clever than lampshading, because he isn't just calling his audience's attention to the fact that he contradicts himself and equivocates in videos, he's also selling them his own explanation for why that happens. He's a milk toast, moderate fence sitter, he can't make up his mind. He's easily swayed. He's a soft, spongy, inoffensive guy with no strongly held convictions. As I mentioned at the start of the video, it's obviously not a nice thing for people to have this perception of you. But you know, when people call you a fence sitter, they're not really impugning your moral character. A fence sitter equivocates not to deceive or trick or manipulate anyone. They do it because they're unsure about things. If you're someone who routinely equivocates as much as Tim does, being called a fencer is kind of like a get out of jail free card. As long as Tim's audience believes him to be a fencer, they're not going to view him as a liar or someone who exploits their anxieties or a sensationalist who distorts the news to make them click on his videos while simultaneously walking back all of his own claims so that he can't be pinned down on any of the misinformation he spreads. You know, Tim enthusiastically lays claim to the nominal title of fencer for a reason. It's a very effective red herring for him, a way of preemptively giving his viewers a socially acceptable explanation for his behavior, which distracts from the far more negative conclusion which one could reasonably come to about someone who constantly alleges things without commensurate evidence and then flaccidly walks it all back. That's not to say that the illusion of fencing only works to benefit Tim though, 
It's equally true to say that it has political utility for a lot of his audience as well. One sentiment you'll see reflected amongst a significant proportion of Tim's viewers is the idea that other forms of media are not worth bothering with, for various reasons, but a common one being the media's tendency to exaggerate and tell lies. I know, like, like everybody knows, bombastic sensationalist nonsense makes cash. It really does. And, I, and, and, and there's, there's things that I could do that I don't want to do and I won't do it. CNN has no scruples, they'll do it. The illusion of Tim being a political moderate, a fence sitter, mutually reinforced by creator and audience alike, allows viewers to indulge themselves in the sensationalism Tim delivers, while simultaneously being invested in the belief that it is not sensationalism they are viewing, that they are actually getting a moderate and reasonable perspective in which the vitriolic emotions on display are a moderate response to the highly corrupt times we're living through. There's gratification for Tim's viewers in affirming him as a milquetoast fence sitter, not because of what the label says about him, but what it says about them. If the political commentator you choose to get your news from is a reasonable, moderate person, then by proxy, so are you for choosing them. I think Timple viewers enjoy the feeling of being the American everyman, the silent majority, normal, sensible people in a world of idiots who believe everything they're told by the mainstream media. That can be an incredibly validating feeling, particularly if you're someone who might face scorn or derision for your political beliefs in real life. The only problem with the illusion of moderation on Tim's channel is, of course, that it's not true. Regardless of how respectably Tim sells it, it isn't milquetoast or moderate to allege that the deep state is artificially inserting candidates into the race at the 11th hour, or to allege based on paper thin evidence that your political opponents are arming themselves for an insurrection, or to think that your political candidate is somehow gonna get a 49 state landslide, or to think that the people you share a country with are on the verge of civil warring you. These are unequivocally batshit crazy, politically extremist viewpoints, which have unfortunately become normalized amongst Tim's audience due to a mix of the anxieties being fueled, and perhaps also not insignificantly, the fact that Tim bundles them up with fence-sitting platitudes, making politically extremist fear-mongering feel that much more plausible, reasonable, and normal. The important thing to remember is that the illusion of Tim Pool being a fencer is a red herring, reinforced by both the man himself and the audience he's cultivated. By self-identifying as a fencer, Tim gets to spread baseless, attention-grabbing narratives whilst rowing them back for plausible deniability, and his audience gets to feel like they've not chosen to watch someone who grossly exaggerates, spins, and plays into their worst instincts, but rather a balanced, moderate reporter who just happens to echo their most paranoid thoughts because those thoughts are correct. And that is a powerful foundation for Tim's channel to remain successful for a long time to come. Hey yo, white people going crazy in the comments. Yes, 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 hope you're well. Thank you very much for sticking around to the end of this video. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, please like and subscribe to increase the serotonin that will flood my brain. The names whizzing up the screen right now are my Patreon gang. Thank you all so much for giving me your money. I like it when you do that. If you're a regular Timbar video enjoyer, consider becoming one of them. I need to give a very big shout out to a man called Timple Clips, because this guy helped me massively with the research for both the vids I've made about Tim so far. Whenever I went to him with vague descriptions of things I remember Tim saying at some point in the past, he knew what videos I was on about, and I can't thank him enough for his help. I couldn't have done this without him. Now, onto a slightly new thing for my channel. In the credits sections of my vids, I often like to spitball, so there's some time for my patrons' names to scroll by at a strong and stable speed. And in the last few vids I've done, I found it difficult to think of things to say. So, starting with this vid, I'm inviting my patrons to ask me questions. And in the credits sections of my videos, I will read out answers. So, this video's question comes from Ellie, who asks, who would win in a fight out of all the people you've covered on your channel? Thank you for that thoughtful question, Ellie. It's something I've wanted to address for a while, so I'm glad it's come up. First of all, please understand that I would conceptualize the fight as a battle royale rather than a series of man-to-man -man hand combat tournaments. So we're not necessarily talking about sheer physical prowess here, but rather who can most effectively leverage a strategic victory. 
To me, it's obvious that in the week leading up to the fight, Dave Rubin would tag a lot of other people on Twitter, most likely Larry Elder, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, and Candace Owens, and he'd be like trying to rally them to his side. But obviously, everyone he tagged would ignore him, so he'd just have to come to the fight on his own. James O'Keefe, in a battle royale scenario, would have all kinds of Project Veritas tricks up his sleeve. So he'd be putting on different disguises, he'd be like going behind rocks and coming out dressed as Tim Pool, and he'd be able to turn his opponents against each other with mind games. However, I think Tim Pool pool could dm the proud boys and get them to turn up and fight on his behalf and this would be strategically effective because every time one of the other combatants would point out the unfairness of this he could accuse them of being on antifa's side like everyone's like tim tell the proud boys to stop attacking us this isn't fair and tim's like you're going on and on about the proud boys yet you're completely silent about antifa antifa are disgusting people if we're relegating this to just political figures, then I think James O'Keefe would probably win. Because even with the Proud Boys on the battlefield, James could convert them to his side by showing them an edited video which definitively shows Tim saying, Proud Boys are disgusting. But you know, I also made a video about the Grime MC Flirt of D in 2019. And if he turns up then, you know what time it is. Because whoever I battle, we got so yeah the fight would be flirters if he wants it so i hope that's resolved any confusion people might have around the question of who would win in a fight out of the people i featured on my channel thanks for joining me for this vid and please come back whenever it is that i manage to pump out the next one bye, bye. 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 I'm not